continue our study of the Psalms. If you'd like to turn, we'll be in Psalm 107 tonight. Psalm 107. Uh, and if you haven't been with us prior to this, uh, just a little bit of review. The, uh, Hank, uh, the Psalms are broken into five different um, books. Uh, the 150 Psalms that we have are actually five different books in the, New Te in the Old Testament. Uh, and many of the commentators have noticed that uh, the themes of these book divisions uh, correspond with the respective books of Moses and the Pentateuch, where the first book corresponds with Genesis and, and it lays the foundations of the nation of Israel and second book, Exodus, and so on and so forth. And when we come to Psalm 107, that begins the fifth and last book of the Psalms uh, that would correspond with the book of Deuteronomy. And this was the book that the children of Israel uh, received when they were at the banks of the Jordan River right before they crossed over after their 40 years of wandering. And so it's a book that talks about the promised life, crossing over the Jordan and entering into the John 10:10 10, 10 abundant life. And there's been many themes of peace and, and praise and victory and the faithfulness of the Lord and, and rest in some of the previous 106 Psalms. Uh, but uh, now we come to the crossing of the Jordan and uh, those themes are going to be very much amped up in these last uh, 44 psalms. He says, uh, beginning with verse 1, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Um, this begins as the two previous psalms. If you were here last week, when we looked at Psalm 105 and 106, they, they also started this same way. Uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Uh, and we saw that Psalm 105 and 106 were probably connected together, but Psalm 106 is part of the fifth book. It's not even part of the same section uh, of the division of the Psalms. So it may be have pla been placed here because of the similar beginning, uh, but they're not connected. Uh, and he gives two worthwhile reasons that we should be thankful. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, one, because he's good, and secondly, because he is merciful. And he alone is good, and we are the benefactors of his goodness. Where it says his mercies endure forever, uh, or his mercy endures forever. And you notice the word endures there is in italics. Uh, in fact, of all of the, there's 40 some times in the Old Testament where that phrase occurs. Uh, his mercies endure forever. And it's always in italics. The word endure is always in italics because uh, it's added by the translators of the New King James. Literally, what it says is, for his mercy forever. Uh, and there's more of an emphasis on the foreverness of his mercy, not the endurance of it. Um, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. The word redeemed here, the verb form of it is the word ga'al, and the noun form of it is the word goel. That's the word that we're probably most familiar with uh, in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word that is translated as the kinsman redeemer. Um, Deuteronomy 25 tells the story about uh, what uh, a woman was to do if her husband, she was married to a guy and then he died before they had a chance to bring up a male heir to the guy's inheritance. And uh, according to Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 10, uh, she was to go to his nearest kinsman, presumably uh, the, the closest unmarried brother, which would be most likely the nearest one, and asked him if he would like to take up the right of the deceased brother and take her as his wife, and then the first son that they would have would actually be considered to be the deceased brother's son, and he would receive the inheritance of the deceased man. And this is known as the kinsman redeemer. Uh, then also it's the same word that's used for uh, another role uh, of the goel, and that is as the... Um, avenger of blood. Joshua chapter 20, we're told the story about where they gave the cities of refuge and, and uh, they didn't have a police department in those days. There was no constabulatory or anything like that. And so if somebody was, uh, the, the way that you brought about justice was your family would uh, go meet out an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And it was the responsibility of the nearest kinsman to, if somebody had been killed, it was the responsibility of the nearest kinsman to determine whether or not it was uh, justifiable or not and then mete out the justice that would be associated with it. And if somebody had, had, was guilty of killing somebody, they would run to a city of refuge where they could stay 
uh, until his case was pled before the, the high priest and then his guilt or whether it was manslaughter or uh, justifiable or whatever it may be, it was determined uh, by that. And this was known as the avenger of blood. Now, there, this, the goel, this word redeemer that we have in our text here, the goel, there are three requirements for somebody to be the goel. One is he had to be a near relative. Um, in Philippians uh, chapter 2, we see talking about Jesus, and we're going to see how he is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. All of this system that was set up in the Old Testament was given to the Jewish people as a foreshadowing of the true kinsman redeemer, the true goel, the true redeemer in Jesus Christ. And Philippians 2, 6, and 7 says, "...who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men." So he was, Jesus is the, a near relative to us. He was a fully human being. And so uh, he, required, he met the first requirement of being a near relative. Secondly, they had to be able to redeem. The near kinsman, the kinsman redeemer had to be able to be able to provide what was necessary. Because maybe he would uh, take uh, the, the widow as his bride, but if his brother or the deceased relative had left any debts, he also had to meet those. He had to pay off any debts he had. He had to be able to uh, be able to take care, uh, pick up where the brother had left off. And it says in uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Peter tells us, Knowing that you were not redeemed, you were not bought by, uh, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but instead, Peter tells us that we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Jesus truly was able to redeem us. He was the spotless lamb. He was the perfect sacrifice. And he was able to take our place in judgment and pay the debt that we owed in our, uh, by taking our death to himself. And then thirdly, he had to be willing to redeem. Uh, it was a responsibility. It was an obligation of the nearest kinsman to take this role, but he didn't have to. You know, this is most beautifully given to us in the book of Ruth, where we see that Boaz was uh, Ruth's deceased husband's near kinsman, uh, and he was willing to, but he wasn't the nearest kinsman. There was another guy that had to have first dibs on whether to take her as his wife, and he says, I cannot take her as wife. Maybe he didn't have the money to pay the debts or uh, for whatever reason, but Boaz was able to step in and, of course, the uh, last line of Ruth chapter 4 is that they lived happily ever after. Uh, so uh, you've got to be uh, not only a near kinsman, you've got to be able to do it. And then thirdly, you've got to be willing to do it. As the writer of the Hebrews tells us in chapter two, 12, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus was not only our near kinsman, he was not only up to the task, but he was not only willing, he was more than willing for the joy, which that's me and you. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Um, so he truly is our goel. Have you been redeemed? You know, the psalmist asks, he says, let the redeem, or the state, states that, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Have you been redeemed? Uh, then say so. Uh, you know, it, be, it should be something that we should wear on our sleeves. We should wear uh, on our lapels. It should be something that nobody should ever has to gather that we're Christians. It should be something that nobody would ever have to deduce by our actions that we're Christians. While I believe that we should act like Christians. But we should also be very willing to say so whenever the opportunity arises. And as he's talking about uh, the people that were the redeemed of the Lord, he says they were gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, and they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way, and they found no city to dwell in. Now, most of the commentators believe this is a reference to the captivities of Israel. You know, it began with the Assyrian captivity in 721 uh, BC when the uh, uh, northern kingdom of Israel was captured by the Assyrian nation uh, under Sennacherib. Uh, and then uh, when the Assyrians were taken over by the Babylonians, 
uh, a little over a century later, the, the Babylonians captured the southern kingdom, and that began the captivity of uh, the nation of Judah. And that ca captivity continued all the way up until the Persians took over the Babylonians, and then in 444 B.C., Cyrus gave the decree for them to return to the city uh, of Jerusalem and rebuild it. Um, and most of the commentators think that this is a psalm commemorating those captivities or that captivity. It was kind of like three that rolled into one uh, of Israel, except for what he says in verse 3. You know, what we just read there in verse 3, gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and the south. The, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians only had them captured in the east. Uh, but this indicates that they would be brought from the four corners of the earth. Uh, from their captivity. And I wonder if this isn't a reference to maybe a forward thinking to the millennial kingdom. Or it could be just a matter of what we've seen previously with what we would call uh, poetic hyperbole. You know, where many of the prophets oftentimes, like David says, that he's, his bed swims in tears every night. Uh, just using it in a, a poetic exaggeration in order to make the point. And maybe that's uh, what's in mind here with the, uh, this Psalm 107. And this uh, apparent ambiguity as to the target uh, of the psalm or the subject of the psalm uh, may be for the purpose of its universal application. You know, it may be so that we too would identify uh, with the psalms, uh, especially this one, because, you know, we've all been in a place where we've been lost. And that's, if you, you know, that's, that's a bad thing to be lost. I know guys never admit that, but, but uh, you, we, we've all been lost before, and that's a bad thing. But the worst thing about, uh, worse, worser than being lost is being lost in the wilderness, you know, being lost in the desert. And, and this is what uh, the psalmist is addressing. He says, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them, and they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Uh, you know, hungry and thirsty, when their soul fainted within them, then they cried out to the Lord. You know, when all else had failed, then they cried out to the Lord. When, they, when, you know, now, when there was nothing left to do but pray, then they prayed. Uh, but uh, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. They waited until the very last to cry out. But at least they did. At least they did cry out. And it says that he delivered them. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go into a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. And this phrase, verse, uh, verse 9, Oh, that the men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works uh, to the children of men. This is also repeated in verses 15, 21, and 31. For he satisfies the longing soul, and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. You know, doing verse 8 where he says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord uh, for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Doing verse 8 is the key to experiencing verse 9. You know, giving thanks to the Lord for his wonderful works is the key to understanding uh, that he satisfies the longing soul. Those who sat in darkness in the valley of death bound in affliction and irons. You know, those that are being held in spiritual prison, uh, we might say. Uh, and it's the contrite ones. You know, it, there, there are many people held in a, a spiritual prison uh, that, that are bound up with spiritual feathers, fetters. But it's the contrite ones, the ones that cry out to the Lord, are the ones that get blessed. He says in verse 11, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. You know, how much pain would we alleviate if we would only listen to him when he called out to us. You know, when, whenever we're walking into the wilderness and we're wandering around in the, in, without the protections of the city, the walls, the city walls that would uh, give strength and support and security, and we're out in the wilderness without that, and God calls us to come back into the city of God. And if only we would listen to him, what pain we would uh, escape. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor, and they fell down, and there was none to help. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress, distresses. You know, finally, uh, when they had very, come to the very end of themselves, and they cried out, then the Lord delivered them. And so often that's our case. You know, you've heard the, the old cliche that sometimes when you're flat on your back, there's no place else to look but up. 
and we wait until we get to that position until we cry out to him. He brought them out of darkness in the shadow of death and he broke their chains in pieces. Now, I don't know if it's a gender thing or what, but I don't really dig manuals. You know what I mean? I mean, I'll get a new tool or a new toy or something like that, and I ain't care nothing about, you know, part C connects into tab A or anything like that. I just break it out of the box, plug it in, flip it on, and see how it goes. Uh, I'm, I'm just not a manual kind of guy. I have a hard time following that sort of thing. But then, you know, I do that. I rip it out of the box, plug it in, flip on the switch, and then once the smoke clears, <laughs> then maybe I'll break out the manual. Uh, and, uh, you know, then I might inquire of the instructions. And God will often allow us to exhaust our resources. You know, he'll, he'll allow us to bounce off against the walls. Or he'll allow us to be like a pinball in a pinball machine. And we just bounce back and forth until we finally are tired of bouncing around and then we cry out to him. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Or as Spurgeon says, he says, the sight of such goodness makes a right-handed, right-minded, a right-minded man long to see the Lord duly honored for his amazing mercy. When dungeon doors fly open and the chains are snapped, who can refuse to adore the glorious goodness of the Lord? It makes the heart si sick to think of such gracious mer mercies remaining unsung. We cannot but plead with men to remember their obligations and extol the Lord their God. He says, so, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his wonderful works, for he has broken the gates of bonds, bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted, and their soul abhorred all manner of food. Uh, Pastor Chuck Smith thought this was talking about vegetarians. Um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, they drew near the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Uh, that's, I don't know if that encourages you, but that really encourages me, because he says that God even saves the fools. Uh, and and that's, that's quite an encouragement. Thank you, Jesus. You know, uh, I'm really glad for that one. Uh, but in the Bible, when it talks about fools, the Bible doesn't talk about fools in the same way that we think of fools. You know, when the Bible, when the Old Testament speaks of a fool, it's talking about the person that closes their ears to God. It's, it, it's the fool that says in his heart there is no God. Uh, and that's what the Bible is talking about. It's, it's those that rebel against him, that reject him. But he, in his mercy and in his goodness, even fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted, uh, and they abhorred all kinds of good food, you know, all kinds of red meat. Uh, they drew near the gates of death, but then they cried out to the Lord, and he delivered them. And he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Do you believe this? I mean, do you, you, you think that this is true? Uh, that the Lord is faithful when we are wandering around in the wilderness and we've gone our own way and he's called to us and we don't want to hear it. We don't want, we're not concerned with, with uh, his word at the time. We just want to go out and do our own thing. And, and finally, when we exhaust all of our resources, when we find ourselves flat on our back, and we look up and we cry out to him, and he's faithful to deliver us. Do you really believe that? Of course you do. I mean, we wouldn't be here on a Wednesday night if we didn't, but it seems to me, it just seems like it would be more uh, uh, logical that if we really did, we would be more diligent about hiding it in our hearts. You know, he says, then he sent his word and he healed them. How does a young man cleanse his way? When we get to Psalm 119, we'll find out. It's by hiding his word in our hearts. And I think if we really, really, truly believe this in our hearts, not just simply in our heads, we'd be more diligent about that. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Uh, now, people say that we don't do sacrifices today because we're in the New Testament era. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, every time I grill burgers, I'm thanking Jesus. You know, I mean, I, I kind of consider that a, a, a praise offering to the Lord myself. Uh, but we still, even though we don't offer animals on an altar, 
uh, and even though Jesus was the end of the sin offering, uh, we still make sacrifices. You know, we still sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, and he says here that the, uh, let, the, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. That's a good one. That's a good sacrifice to give to the Lord, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Uh, Hebrews 13 and 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, that's a, that's a good sacrifice for Christians to remember. Then he goes through a little shift here in verse 23, a little shift of, of uh, uh, subject matter anyway, even though the context is still the same. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Now, the Israelites, as we've seen many times before, the Israelites were land lovers. You know, when God made the covenant with Abraham, he didn't promise him the oceans. He gave him the land. And they, they're, they're people of the land. Uh, they always see themselves as people of the land. Uh, Eretz Yisrael means the people of the land. And, and uh, I mean, their idea of a sea was the Sea of Galilee, you know, which is slightly bigger than Lake Hefna. Uh, and when they, went, when they went to the Mediterranean, they saw that. It would just, that was beyond their comprehension. They couldn't even think of something like that. And so when they saw guys like the Phoenicians, they were seafaring people. And they would see these guys get in their ships and then go out and then disappear over the horizons. That was just, that was awe-inspiring to them. And said, so they, those that go down to the sea in ships and they do business on great waters, woo, doggies, they would say. Uh, for he commands and raises the stormy wind which w lifts the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens and they go down to the depths. You know, why would anybody get out in a perfectly good boat and go out in the middle of this body of water where a storm could arise at any time? They had seen the storms on the Sea of Galilee, and those are bad enough. But to get out in the middle of the Mediterranean, and, and you know, he, the way he described it, he says, uh, they, the Lord lifts the waves up in the sea, and then they mount up to the heavens, and then they go down to the depths. You know, and you can just picture their, them... Uh, thinking of the ship going up on this 20-foot wake and then going down uh, into this uh, bottomless valley of water below as the wave would subside. They mount up to the heavens and they go down into the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro, <laughs> pretty green as they do so too, and they drag, stagger like a drunken man, and they're at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brings them out of their distresses and calms the sea so its waves are still. You know, in the, uh, the old King James, it says, He maketh the storm a calm. You know, he doesn't just simply calm the storm, as the new King James says. I like the way the old King James puts it. He, he makes the storm a calm. He doesn't just simply calm it. He turns it into the very thing. It, it, it is the calm. And he says, and then they are glad because they are quiet. Whereas the old King James says, and again, I like this, he says, and then they are glad because they be quiet. You know, the, he made the storm a calm and it be quiet. Um, so he guides them to their desired haven. You know, if the Bible guys were writing today, you know, they looked at the ships going out in the ocean in those days. 4,000 years ago, they would look at it and they go, man. God's creation is so awesome. The, what he does with the waves, how he you know, can bring a storm up and he can you know, toss that big boat to and fro without any kind of... Uh, the, the rudder isn't even in the water anymore. They have no control. The sa sails have blown away. And yet it's all in the sovereign control of God's hands. And when he decrees, that so the storm becomes calm and, and the, the people are delivered. And they were just blown away at the magnitude of God. If the Bible guys that were writing the Bible back then were alive today, what would they do with things like uh, supernovas and, and black holes and quantum physics and, and DNA? You know, the understanding of those sort of things. Uh, they would be just literally... Blown. I mean, you, the, the awe that they expressed of God's creation back then when all they could see was what they could see with the naked eye, what would it be like today if they could see it? I mean, the so-called simple cell, which I remember from my biology class many years ago, the so-called simple cell ain't. You know, there's nothing simple about it. And, I, I mean, it, it really is a befuddlement to me to think that the more man learns about the awesomeness of God's creation the less in awe they are of him. You know, it should be the opposite, shouldn't it? 
I mean, the more we see of the vastness of God's creation, it should cause us to be uh, more in, in uh, uh, submission to him. We should be, bow before him in, in greater reverence instead of trying to be more independent of him. Oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You know, the way this works, and the way the psalmist is expressing it is, you know, somebody is just going through life like me. And I get caught up in my things and my, my fancies and my distractions. And, I, you know, it's not bad stuff. I don't go out and do bad stuff. I just go out and do my stuff. And I, I could be busy, you know, doing all this. And then God is kind of there, and he's been tapping on my door, and he's been trying to whisper in my ear. He's been trying to get my attention. And, and, but I'm too distracted. I'm too busy. And, and he goes, you know, I haven't heard from Ken a while. <laughs> I know what I'll do. And he just knocks my legs out from under me. And he brings me to that place where I have to cry out to him. Uh, he, I didn't hear the still, small voice. So he brings the storm. Yeah, he brings whatever is necessary to uh, bring me back to that place of, of reverence. He says, let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He turns the wilderness into pools of water. He can take a, a big lake and dry it up or he can take a desert and make it an ocean. Dry land into water springs. He makes the hungry dwell that he may establish the city for a dwelling place. He sows fields and plants vineyards that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them, and they multiply greatly. And he does not let their cattle decrease. And when they are diminished and brought low through oppression or affliction and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. And then he sets the poor on high, far from affliction, and makes their families like a flock. The righteous see it and rejoice, and the iniquity stops its mouth. Whoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. You know, the wise will respond to the workings of God in their life. The wise will be sensitive to when God uses the measures that are at his disposal to bring us into alignment with him. The wise will do it, the fools won't. You know, the fools will end up saying, well, if God is such a good God, then why do these things happen to me? Psalm 108 forms a medley. Uh, and verses uh, 1 to 5, it's a medley of some earlier psalms. Verses 1 to 5 correspond with Psalm 57, 7 to 11. And then Psalms, the verses uh, 6 to 13 correspond with Psalm 60, verses 5 to 12. And we could ask ourselves, I mean, they're, they're word for word from these two psalms. So he just took... Uh, some from Psalm 57 and some from Psalm 50, uh, 60 put them together and made Psalm 107 or 108. And, you know, writing materials back in those days was rare. It was expensive. It was difficult. It, 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 it took work to be able to write something. And we could ask ourselves, why would the Holy Spirit go through all of the work to try to duplicate what had already been done? Why didn't he just make a little postscript and say, go back and read Psalm 57 and Psalm 60? Uh, why would he go through all the trouble to ha cause it to all be written once again as though it was original for the first time? He doesn't even tell us it's a rerun. Uh, Spurgeon, I think, gives us a little insight here where he says, The Holy Spirit is not so short of expressions that he needs to repeat himself, and the repetition cannot be meant merely to fill the book. There must be some intention in, in the arrangement of the two former divine utterances in a new connection. Whether we can discover that intent is another matter. It is at least ours to endeavor to do so, and we may expect divine assistance therein. And so as Psalm 57 and 60 are, these are this is a Psalm of David, and it's just titled a song. It says, O my God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Awake, Luke and harp, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. You know, David was arguably the most, the, the greatest poet of all time. Uh, I mean, his works have endured the centuries. Uh, he was long before Homer and Cicero. He was way before Shakespeare and Keats and, and, and uh, 
Eliot and all the other poets. He, 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 and his works have endured. In fact, they have grown in appreciation and they have stirred more souls. They have uh, encouraged more people and convicted more people than any previous writings. And yet David played a one-string banjo or lute, as the case may be. Uh, and and it, it, he, he was pretty singular in his endeavors. And that was to praise Jesus, to praise the Lord. Uh, he just simply wanted to keep his uh, affection and attention uh, to God. And he says, I will praise you among the peoples. In fact, I'm going to praise you among all the nations. For your mercy is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice, and I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkoth. Uh, you know, here, here, here's a, a newsflash. God delights in delivering us. You know, he, he, one of his titles is the God who delivers. Uh, he wants to free us from our captors. He wants to set us free. He wants to bring us from uh, our trials and tribulations. He rejoices in delivering us. And, and he's saying, uh, you know, he's going to go through uh, an acknowledgement of how God has exalted his people and yet he has destroyed those that would, would come against him. Uh, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is also the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab, and this is not a compliment. Moab is my wash pot. You know, it's the place where I wash. I, over Edom I will cast my shoe, and over Philistia I will tramp, uh, triumph. You know, these places, these perennial enemies of Israel, I wash my feet. I, I put my dirty feet in, in their wash pots. That's what, that's what they're used for. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who will cast us who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our enemies? Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. I can remember. <clears throat> I can remember. You guys don't. You're too young. But I can remember back with the whole Y2K scare. And in December of 1999, people were going frantic. Uh, there were some people making a lot of money selling canned beans and, and, and uh, 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 underground shelters and, and, and books. I mean, there were a lot of people that were really prospering during that time, but many other people were freaking out, and they were wondering what's going to happen. It was uh, viewed to be the end of the world as we knew it. And I remember listening to Pastor Chuck on the radio one day. And it was a call-in program. And somebody had called in. And, and this was about the middle of December and when the, the kind of the height of the fervor was going on about what are we going to do about Y2K when the calendar changes from 1999 to 2000. And none of the computer chips and all of the different devices around the world from shavers to supercomputers were equipped to handle that two-digit change from 99 to 00. Because all of the computer chips would think that it was 1900 rather than 2000. And so the, all the, the power grids were going to go down. Uh, the computers weren't going to work. We, are, we wouldn't have heat and gas and water. And, and uh, we got to get a, a manual can opener for your grand be green beans because electric can openers aren't going to work. And, and somebody called in Pastor Chuck, and they asked him, what do we do about Y2K? And Chuck just gave that kind of a gentle chuckle like he was wont to do. And then he quoted Psalm, one four, or one, uh, Psalm 46, verse 1, verse 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And he went on to read the rest of the psalm where it talks about how the, the mountains are destroyed and cast into the ocean and all these sort of things happen. And, and yet God is still going to be in charge. And then it ends the psalm by saying, be still and know that I'm God. And I remember hearing that and I was just, I was just thinking, that's it. That's the, the church is missing that because the church is all about what are we going to do? And, and what the psalmist is saying, you're going to trust God. You're going to rest in Him. Now, that doesn't mean you want, don't want to have an extra blanket around or, or get some, a few extra gallons of water just you know, like you would for any kind of a storm that might be coming. Uh, but you don't freak out because God is in charge. If only we would learn to come to Him instead of men. Through God, 
we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. You know, contrary to popular belief, the, 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 I, I know the most quoted scripture in, Bible, in the Bible is cleanliness is next to godliness, but the next most quoted scripture in the Bible is God helps those who help themselves. And contrary to popular belief, that ain't in the Bible. And not only is it not in the Bible, it's definitely not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, God doesn't help those who help themselves, but he, it's just the opposite. He helps those who depend, depend upon him. He helps those that come to him in, in reliance, in submission. Uh, he delights in doing that. That's when he delivers us. Psalm 109 is, we've seen some imprecatory psalms before. But Psalm 109 is an imprecatory psalm with a capital M. Okay, I mean, this is, this is uh, considered to be the most, the most imprecatorial of all imprecatory psalms. I mean, this is like major league imprecatorialness, okay? Uh, at the very least, as we go through this psalm, and I know there's a lot of people have a hard time understanding uh, what David's in, in, in imprecatory means you, you are wishing judgment upon somebody. You want bad to happen to them. And a lot of people have trouble interpreting those in light of, how does this Old Testament psalm fit into New Testament theology? But at the very least, and we've talked about that in, in, as we've looked at some of the previous psalms, but at the very least, this ought to convince us of the severity of the, how God views the severity of our sins that we commit with our lips. That's what most of the psalm talks about, is the people that bla blaspheme and, and slander and lie and gossip and backbite. I notice the title of it. To the chief musician, the Psalm of David. Now, whenever you see that in a psalm, when it says to the chief musician, that means it was a psalm to be used in public worship. Now, could you, just, as we're going through this, just picture us singing this song on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue, and they have also surrounded me with words of hatred. They have fought against me without a cause. And in return for my love, they are my accusers. I will give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. I'm sure we've all experienced this in some degree. We've all had people turn against us. Uh, I, I imagine we've all had people that we loved and cared for turn against us. People that we've tried to help have bitter hands. Uh, people that we've tried to show God's love to has shown the devil's ire in response. Uh, and unfortunately, that has oftentimes happened in the name of God. You know, proclaiming to be doing the Lord's work, they actually are, are tools uh, of the enemy. Um, and there's not one here, and I'm not even suggesting that, that I'm giving the Holy Spirit an idea of how to write his word here, but... I think after verse 5 would be a good place for a sailor. You know, just to stop and think about what he's saying. Spurgeon, he says this about this verse. What a smart this is to the soul, to be hated in proportion to the gratitude which it deserved, hated by those it loved, and hated because of its love. You know, the devil's job, the devil's goal in working in us you know, he, 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 I know he's the, the uh, tempter and I know that he's the slanderer and that he's the accuser. But I think all of that kind of wrapped up, it kind of makes his job fairly singular because Paul tells the Ephesians that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against all the booger heads in the heavenly places, all the various satanic minions. We're all familiar with that verse. We've done BBSs about the fruit of the Spirit. We've, we've all uh, learned this verse and this, what it says about uh, uh, spiritual warfare. We've, we've memorized it as children. We're very familiar with what it says uh, about not wrestling against flesh and blood. But as I was doing a little inventory today, as I was looking back over the trials and tribulations and the wrestling and the fighting that I've had in my life, I have not had a single one that felt like it was initially a spiritual trial. I mean, it really does seem like 
It's taking place right here on earth. It doesn't seem like it's taking place in the heavenlies. It seems like it's wrestling against flesh and blood. It doesn't seem like it's wrestling against uh, demons. Uh, that happens once I bring every thought into captivity. Once I realize what's going on, then I can realize it's spiritual warfare. But my first in inclination is to see it as, as being very physical because that's usually where it's worked out. That's where it takes place. It's fought down here on terra firma. And the devil's job, I think, is to get me to believe that I don't wrestle against spiritual things, but I wrestle against flesh and blood. And if he can get me to do that, if he can get me to think this battle is truly physical, that this person that's blaspheming me or, or slandering me or, or spreading bad things about me or, or uh, doing any kind of things like that verbally, that that's really the source of it, that's really the, the, uh, the, the substance of the issue. If he can get me to think of that person rather than think of the spiritual uh, evil behind it, then he's won. And he says that these guys that have done that, that have rewarded my, uh, uh, have rewarded me with evil for good and, and my hatred, hatred with my love, he says, set a wicked man over him, verse 6, and let an accuser stand in his right hand. Uh, the word accuser here is the word Satan in the original language, and that's why if you got the old King James, they actually put the word Satan in here. They said, put Satan in his right hand. Let Satan be the one that stands behind, beside him. I mean, if he's going to act like the devil, then let, let, let the devil be his advocate. Let the devil be his right hand. And uh, I'm not sure that the King James is that far off. You know, the word Satan is the Hebrew word for accuser, uh, but that is where the devil got his name. And, and Spurgeon, again, if I can quote him again, he says, The curse is an awful one, but it is most natural that it should come to pass. Those who serve Satan may expect to have his company, his assistance, his temptations, and at last, his doom. And then as David continues here, he says, And when he's judged, let him be found guilty. And let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. In other words, let the guy die real quick. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Now, a lot of times we can read these kind of songs and we go, man, that sounds sort of heartless. I mean, I understand you wishing that the guy could be taken out. I, you know, stop him, Lord, from doing his evil stuff. But why do their children have to suffer? And one of the big complaints against the Lord is when he sent the Israelites into the land of Canaan. He says, I want you to wipe them all out. Wipe out the, the families, wipe out the kids, their dogs, their cats, their goldfish. Take, I don't want any of them to live. And we think, What's up with that, God? But then, you know, how many tears were, were shed when, remember Agag, when Saul was supposed to do that with Agag, and he didn't, and then uh, Samuel comes in, and he says, what's this bleeding of goats? And then he says, who's this over here? And Saul said, well, that's the king Agag. I saved him as a, as a prize. And he says, God would desi desire uh, obedience rather than, than sacrifice. And he goes over and picks up Saul's sword, and he goes over to Agag, and just one swoop wipes off his head. And I remember reading that when I was a kid, and I was like, you go, Sammy. And, you know, ooh, that's a good story. Didn't cry for Agag's kids then. In fact, it was descendants that grew up, and uh, a few centuries later, we got Haman the Agagite in the land of Persia who tries to conspire to have all of the Jews wiped out. Sennacherib, when he, the Assyrians were doing all of their thing, and, and he, you know, he was the one that sent the 70, 175,000 uh, Assyrians to surround Jerusalem, and, and uh, Hezekiah brought his threats to the Lord, and the Lord said, don't worry about it, I got it all under control. And that night, the entire Assyrian army, all 175,000 of them died. And Sennacherib went back to his uh, headquarters with his tail between his legs, and his own people executed him assassinated him. Nobody cried for Sennacherib's kids then. They weren't worried about him being orphans or Herod the Great when he slaughtered all the babies and, and did all those things to try to break, stop the bloodline from happening. And, and one day he, he was giving this big speech and they said, oh, that's not the voice of a man, that's the voice of a god. And Herod's kind of like all about, you know, well, I'm so glad you guys noticed. And it says that worms started coming in and out of his body and he died right there on the spot. We get grossed out over the worm thing, but we don't cry over his kids. You know, and Nero and Caligula and Severus and all the Roman emperors that were so bad. Um, 
and I, I'm not saying that we should be heartless toward children, but uh, I think when God says that I want that bloodline wiped out, it's a reason because that bloodline is rabid. Uh, that bl bloodline is going to only produce more ill and more uh, suffering for my people. And I, I've waited for them, I've strove, striven with them, and yet they rejected me, and so now they're judged. Let the creditor seize all that he has. Let the strangers plunge his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him, let there, uh, nor let there be any favor to his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and the generation following let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. You know, he's just, he's just, and, and your mama too, you know, I mean, it's just kind of like, a, just let them continually be before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. But he did not remember to show mercy, meaning the guy that was doing all this, but persecuted the poor and the needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. You know, mercy begets mercy, and evil begets evil. It's, and so, as he loved cursing, so let it come to him. You know, not talking about swearing, not talking about using four-letter words, but cursing, like uttering curses upon people. So let those curses fall back on him. As he did not delight in blessing, let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing as with his garment, so let it enter his body like water and like oil to his bones. Let it be to him like a garment which covers him and for a belt which he girds himself continually. You know, there is in the law what's called lex talionis. And it's from the Latin, and it means, it basically, it's a, uh, let the, the, the punishment be equal to the crime. Uh, you know, it's not the, the Muslim thing about if somebody gets caught stealing, then you cut off their right hand. And if they get caught again, you cut off their left hand. You know, it's, it's not that kind of, but the punishment should be equal to the crime. And the Romans didn't invent that. I mean, this was in the law, you know, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth kind of deal. Um, let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers and those who speak evil against my person. Now, we can see this as, as David being a little vengeful of himself, except that back in verse 8 where he says, let another man take his office. You know, when the, this guy that's doing that, don't let him continue in that place. In fact, cut off his posterity and everything. Peter quotes that verse in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, and applies it to Judas. Uh, and he says that as, as David prophesied in the Psalms, let another take his office. I mean, we've all been betrayed by loved ones. But nobody here has been betrayed like Jesus. Uh, you know, we can all claim innocence to a certain degree when people come against us, but we're guilty of something. You know, we not be, may not be guilty of what they're accusing us of, but we're, we're not totally uh, excused in the situation. But Jesus was guilty of nothing. And not only was he guilty of nothing, but he took the shame for everything. And so Judas is... Uh, Betrayal was the ultimate one, and this is what Paul or Peter even uh, ascribes this psalm to Judas. He says, uh, "But you, O Lord, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake, because your mercy is good. Deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me." You know, as David is, whatever this account is, we don't know what if this is. You know, he had many people that came against him verbally, and and uh, he had many enemies. We don't know which one of them he's thinking of at this time. But he is broken by it. And he cries out for God, for his mercy. He said, I'm not going to get mercy from my enemy. I want to get mercy from you. He says, because I am poor and needy. And I think what he's speaking of is what Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 5, where he speaks of those who are poor in spirit, those who come in spiritual bankruptcy. Uh, God will hear. Verse 23, I'm gone like a shadow when it lengthens. And I'm shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh is feeble from the lack of fast, fatness. I also have become a reproach to them. And when they look at me, they shake their heads. Oh, help me, O oh Lord my God. Oh, save me according to your mercy, that they may know that it is your right hand, that you, Lord, have done it. You know, David's primary concern, even through the imprecatory psalms, his primary concern, even when he's crying out for uh, the, the falling of his enemy or when he's crying out for the Lord to restore him, his primary concern is the Lord's name. I don't want them to be able to use this as an, uh, an occasion to blaspheme your name, Lord. I want you to do, it for, do this for your name's sake, uh, that they may know that it's you who have done it. Let them curse, but you bless. 
When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let your servant rejoice. Let my accusers be clothed with shame. Let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. And then he closes out, he gives praises in advance to the Lord, believing that his deliverance will come. And so he, he praises them even before the fact, uh, knowing that the Lord will come through. I will greatly praise the Lord in my youth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you tonight, and we, uh, many of us can identify with uh, the words of these three diverse psalms in some way or another. We've, many of us have had uh, people who we care deeply for and who thought were our brother or our sister have turned against us. Many of us have found ourselves wandering around in uh, the wilderness and uh, looking for uh, some place of security only to find arid places as we wander away from um, your peace and your security. Um, Lord, many of us have uh, found ourselves in that place of uh, coming before you as our great Redeemer, as our great Savior, in receiving that security and that, that fullness and that, uh, uh, just, Lord, the, the deliverance that you had to give. We thank you for these words. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that your word endures, that it is true forevermore. We thank you for your mercy, Lord, and how David cried out for it and how much we... Uh, to cry for your mercy that your grace and love would be abundant that everyone would see it and know that it was your hand that provided it all this we ask lord as we pray in jesus name amen